Hello audience, this is Fax5. I'm here with tangent number five. That's right everybody. It's number five. Time for some celebratory music. This has been Celebratory Music with Fax Fivem. I should warn my listenership in advance that, even by tangent standards, this one is very unusual. It is not only the longest tangent, but a good deal of it, at least at the beginning, is discussing the history of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. So... Honestly, uh, I'm just going to read through that part at the beginning. It is important, if not a bit rambly. But it is part of the tangent. And I guess the oddities are part of the charm. Well, let's get into this, bad boy. Tangent 5. All quotations in Tangent 5 are from David I. Garrow's Bearing the Cross, William Morrow and Company, New York, 1986, used without permission. Well, he's actually citing something, so that's nice. Before MIA became more widely synonymous with missing in action, it was first the acronym of the Montgomery Improvement Association, an organization which, on the basis of the May 17, 1954 U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka, which held that the segregationist doctrine of separate but equal was unconstitutional, campaigned to desegregate the city buses of Montgomery, Alabama. The association chose to do this by means of a boycott with the Montgomery City Lines buses by its black patrons, insightfully grasping the fact that the greatest leverage possible in effecting change in a capitalist society is the withholding of capital. The black population of Montgomery represented fully three quarters of all bus patrons in that city. The MIA was composed of leaders from the Montgomery black community, many of whom were Baptist ministers. While the means, the boycott, and the ends, desegregation, were clear, this was Alabama, and the conquest of their own individual and collective fear was, clearly, their most pressing ongoing concern. When word came that newspaper photographers would be attending an early MIA meeting, some of the ministers seemed reluctant to volunteer as speakers. E.D. Nixon, a past president of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, rebuked them angrily, quote, Somebody in this thing has got to get faith. I am just ashamed of you. You said that God has called you to lead the people, and now you are afraid and gone to pieces because the man tells you that the newspaper men will be here and your pictures might come out in the newspaper. Somebody has got to get hurt in this thing, And if you preachers are not the leaders, then we have to pray that God will send us some more leaders. The presidency of the fledgling MIA devolved upon a young minister named Martin Luther King, whose call to the ministry by his own admission, quote, was not a miraculous or supernatural something. On the contrary, it was an inner urge calling me to serve humanity, end quote. He had previously existed in a state of skepticism until I studied a course in the Bible which I came to see that behind the legends and myths of the book were many profound truths which one could not escape Italic's mind. Now, of course, I was religious. I grew up in the church. I'm the son of a preacher. My grandfather was a preacher. My great-grandfather was a preacher. My only brother is a preacher. My daddy's brother is a preacher. So I didn't have much choice, I guess. The first time that Martin Luther King addressed the Montgomery Improvement Association, he told them, We must keep God in the forefront. Let us be Christian in all our action. If it was true that conquering their own fear was the largest concern of the MIA membership, it was certainly no less of a pressing imperative for the association's young president. A critical moment arrived for him on the night of January 27th, 1955 when his faith in himself and his ability to serve in his new capacity was at a low ebb. 
The phone rang, the latest in a series of anonymous callers to the home he had shared with his wife and baby daughter. N, we are tired of you and your mess now, and if you aren't out of this house in three days, we're going to blow your brains out and blow up your house, as Martin Luther King recalled it later. I got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. I was weak. Something said to me, you can't call on daddy now. He's up in Atlanta, 175 miles away. You can't even call on mama now. You've got to call on the something in the person that your daddy used to tell you about. That power that can make a way out of no way. And I discovered then that religion had become something real to me. And I had to know God for myself. And I bowed down over that cup of coffee. I will never forget it. I prayed a prayer, and I prayed out loud that night. I said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think I'm right. I think the cause that we represent is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage, and I can't let the people see me like this. Because if they see me weak and losing my courage, they will begin to get weak. And it seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. And I can't let the people... And lo, I will be there with you. Even unto the end of the world. I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still to fight on. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. The King House was bombed several nights later. As King addressed the congregation at Ralph Abernathy's First Baptist Church, in his own words, King, quote, accepted the word of the bombing calmly. My religious experience a few nights before had given me the strength to face it, end quote. Addressing the crowd which had gathered outside his home, a crowd which, not surprisingly, threatened at any moment to turn into an unruly mob, King said, I want you to love your enemies, be good to them, love them and let them know you love them. If I am stopped, this movement will not stop. If anything happens to me, there will be others to take my place. An ancient schism as old as humanity itself began to form within that quote-unquote movement. Hard on the heels of these extraordinary events, to me, it was a schism exemplified, on the one hand, by the comments of Joanne Robinson, president of the Montgomery Women's Political Council. The amazing thing about our movement is that it is a protest of the people, it is not a one-man show. It is not the preacher's show. It is the people, the masses of this town, who are tired of being trampled on, are responsible. The leaders couldn't stop it if they wanted to. And on the other, by the words of Reverend Glenn E. Smiley, a white official of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and an expert on nonviolence and the nonviolent stratagems of Mahatma Gandhi. Writing to friends, Smiley described his first interview with Martin Luther King as... One of the most glorious yet tragic interviews I've ever had. He went on to say that, I believe that God has called on Martin Luther King to lead a great movement here and in the South. But why does God lay a, such a burden on one so young, so inexperienced, so good? King can be a black Gandhi, or he can be made into an unfortunate demagogue destined to swing from a lynch mob's tree. After addressing one of the early Montgomery Improvement Association mass meetings himself, Smiley also wrote, Religious fervor is high, and they are trying to keep it spiritual. Not once was there an expression of hatred towards whites and the ovation I received when I talked of Gandhi, his campaign, and then of the cross was tremendous. They want to do the will of God, and they are sure this is the will of God. Unfortunately for Reverend, or rather Dr. King, oh no, his people and his movement. Smiley's influence was quickly overshadowed by that of Bayard Rustin. A known communist sympathizer, a suspected communist party member, and a homosexualist who said of the MIA... <sighs> Dang fucking nabbit, man. Ugh. The movement in Montgomery is strong because it is religious as well as it is political. It has been built upon the most stable institution of the southern black community, the church. Most of Bayard's comments, not surprisingly, amount to damning with faint praise. To the faithful, the church is a stable institution, only insofar as it is sustained by the abiding faith of its members in God. That is, the church as an institution is not the same thing as the Elks Club, the Times of London, Westminster, or the American Communist Party. 
to view it as such is to endeavor tactically to diminish its indefinitely larger and indefinitely more significant role in human affairs to a commonplace, mundane, and tactical level. Not surprisingly, this is always the approach secular interests take in describing the church. Note Rustin's description of the movement as religious as well as political, as if the two forces were of comparable validity, as opposed to Smiley's view of the early MIA as a Christian enterprise seeking to do the will of God in the area of racial injustice. Quote, we must keep God in the forefront, as Reverend King said. You know, I actually do know a little bit about Bayard Rustin off the top of my mind. Um... When it says a suspected Communist Party member, he actually was a member of the Communist Party during most of the Great Depression. However, he left the party in 1941 because he did dig the Communist Party's, you know, anti-war thing. But then after the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, the American Communist Party went full pro-war and that irked Rustin, so he left. Likewise, Rustin, he may have helped lay the groundwork for some of the OG neocons. Now, most of my listeners, when they hear neocon, they probably think George W. Bush and a very aggressive foreign policy. But uh, that's kind of the more modern definition. The original definition of a neocon refers to people who were part of the kind of old left of the 1930s, sometimes communists, who eventually left communism and embraced conservatism. Just about all of these folks had very aggressive foreign policy views. They wanted America to be very active in what they perceived as a fight against global communism. And as time went on and the original neocons kind of aged out, people who were not as old and were not originally involved in communist struggles of the 1930s, they took that foreign policy aspect to heart and that's kind of why the term neocon, at least in the modern context, refers to folks who have a very, a very aggressive foreign policy. Now, I'm currently reading from a little blurb about Rustin from the Washington Post from 2013, which reads, By the end of his life, Rustin was the chairman of Social Democrats USA the pro-Vietnam War successor party that emerged out of the Socialist Party's collapse in the 1970s and which was a breeding ground for many neoconservatives. Indeed, the word neoconservative was first used as a, as a term of abuse for members of the Social Democrats USA. Rustin opposed the war but also opposed withdrawing without a negotiated settlement. As late as 1975, Rustin sent President Gerald Ford a letter urging him to, quote, do whatever is possible to secure the freedom of Vietnamese whose lives are now threatened by the communist military victors. I personally find Dave Sims' characterization of Rustin as extremely lazy and insulting. But back to the essay. One of the foremost potential problems that the movement faced, and which was not widely known until much later, was Dr. King's womanizing. Where? It looks like he... He just he italicized the doctor but a couple of times, but not every time. Okay. <laughs> His manifold acts of adultery. It is almost inconceivable to me that someone could consider himself a good Christian and a minister of the gospel and conduct himself in his personal life the way Dr. King did. Although the secular humanist socialists he allowed into the SCLC could remark, with equanimity, as one staff member did, I watched women making passes at Martin Luther King. I could not believe what I was seeing in white, Wichester County, an affluent New York satellite community, women. They would walk up to him and they would sort of lick their lips and, hit and hand him notes. After I saw that thing that evening, I didn't blame him. His behavior was obviously blameworthy. It seems to me that the sort of precautions taken by the evangelist Billy Graham of never communicating with women one-on-one -on -one unless there was a staff member present, present, as in being self-evidently privy to any conversation, however quietly whispered and intercepting any communication, should have been taken in Dr. King's case. This is not foolproof, of course, as any experience with women will tell you, A, 
a slut is a slut is a slut, and B, there is no slut quite as bad as a rich white slut. But clearly, for a minister of the gospel, messages of Jesus Christ, measures should have been taken. Jesus fucking Christ. Like, I... I can't even laugh at this. This is just nasty, man. Okay. Reverend Ralph Abernathy was assaulted in his church office one night and badly injured by a man who claimed that Abernathy had had an intimate relationship with the man's wife. This prompted Los Angeles pastor J. Raymond Henderson to caution King that he must avoid even the appearance of evil. One of the most damning influences is that of women. They themselves too often delight in the satisfaction they get out of affairs with men of unusual prominence. Enemies are not above using them to a man's detriment. White women can be lures. You must exercise more than care. You must be vigilant indeed. Presumably, Reverend Henderson's warning had some effect, at least in the short term, to judge by the following event. <clears throat> in mid-September, King traveled to New York to speak at several churches to stimulate interest in the Youth March. That same week, his book, Stride Towards Freedom, was published and King made a number of appearances to help promote it. One of those was a Saturday autographing session at Blumenstein's department store in Harlem. King Surrounded by friends and admirers as he sat on a chair in the book department, was suddenly approached by a middle-aged black woman who asked, Is this Martin Luther King? King looked up and replied, Yes, it is. Quickly, the woman pulled a sharp seven-inch Japanese letter opener from her handbag and slammed it into King's upper left chest. The shocked onlookers grabbed the woman and the store security officer handcuffed her. King was fully conscious and remained calmly seated in the chair until an ambulance arrived. With the weapon protruding from his chest, King was driven to nearby Harlem Hospital. As a team of doctors prepared for surgery, police officials brought the assailant, Mrs. Isola Ware Curry, to the hospital for King to make a positive identification. A loaded pistol had been found in her purse, and her incoherent comments indicated severe mental illness. After King identified her, she was taken away to a mental hospital. King would have a scar in the shape of a cross right over his heart, but otherwise... He would suffer no lingering effects. I'm sure that, from the vantage point of my largely feminist readers, I attach too much significance to the fact that, because he was immobilized by this vicious assault, the youth march marked the first time that his wife, Coretta, quote, stood in for him, and that it was Coretta King and Ella Baker who set up a temporary movement office inside Harlem Hospital during Dr. King's recovery. It was shortly after this that Reverend King was quoted as saying, I don't want to own any property. I don't need any property. I don't need a house. A man who devotes himself to a cause, who dedicates himself to a cause, doesn't need a family. Very unusual for a husband to even allow himself to think, let alone say out loud. Of course, no great surprise, he got a house. And then a bigger house. Stanley Levinson was quoted as saying... The house troubled him greatly. When he moved from a very small house to one that was large enough to give the growing family some room, he was troubled by it and would ask all of his close friends when they came to the house whether they didn't think it was too big, and it wasn't right for him to have. And though everyone tried to tell him that this big house wasn't as big as he thought it was, it was a very modest little house. To him it loomed as large as a mansion, and he searched his own mind for ways of making it smaller. Meanwhile, Back at Ella Baker. Ella Baker, along with Rustin and Stanley Levinson, constituted the third in a trinity of socialist, secular, humanist influences which lobbied intensively for Reverend King to confine himself to the role of Dr. King. Again, unfortunately for Reverend King, his people and his movement, she soon attained the position of associate director of the newly founded outgrowth of the MIA the SCLC, or Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Originally a socialist-centered Southern Leadership Conference on transportation, Rustin's tactical, quote, logic of the next step, moved to expand the Montgomery bus boycott into a pan-Southern action. It was only through the insistence of Reverend King that the word Christian was incorporated into the title. 
Rustin had warned that such a move would discourage the non-religious from participating, again unfortunately for Reverend King, his people, and his movement that proved not to be the case. When the SCLC foundered in its period of inactivity, a group of students on its own initiative began sit-ins at segregated lunch counters in North Carolina and soon thereafter organized themselves into the SNCC, or Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of which Ella Baker appointed herself a kind of socialist, secular, humanist den mother while still attached to the SCLC executive. She warned the students that the SCLC would attempt to take over their movement and insisted, in good secular humanist socialist proto-feminist fashion, that the students be left to function without any adult supervision. You know, that out-of-the-mouth-of-babes thing. You know, I'm gonna assume that was just more of a, kind of the youth movement of the time. You know, that whole never trust anyone over 30 thing, or never trust anyone over 30. Now, granted, I can't speak for when exactly that phrase became popular, but I'm estimating that it's that same collective youth energy rather than any sort of feminist out-of-the-mouth-of-babes thing that Dave Sim is suggesting. While undermining the SCLC in the minds of the SNCC, students Ella Baker continued to serve in her role as acting executive director. I would assume that Rustin, Levison, and Coretta had pressured Martin Luther King to advance Ella Baker to such lofty heights in what was now a Christian organization, only in the most ostensible sense, a position which she would ultimately resign. Baker's departure, however, left a legacy of strained feelings, emphasis mine, in its wake. She had never held King or Abernathy in high regard, and once she had formally left the organization, she made no secret of her attitude. Baker had found them unwilling to discuss substantive issues with her as an equal, emphasis mine, and unreceptive to any critical comments she might offer. To James Lawson, an SCLC staff member, the root of the problem was simple. Martin had real problems with having a woman in a high position. Baker also did not support a leader-centered approach to organizing a movement and felt no special awe for King. I was not a person to be enamored of anyone, she noted. The ministers of the SCLC, on the other hand, thought Baker was haughty and aloof with what they felt was a disdain for anyone who was a black male preacher. The resulting bitterness would not mellow with time. In fairness to Baker, she did warn King early in her participation with the movement that we are losing the initiative in the civil rights struggle in the South, mainly because of the absence of a dynamic philosophy or spiritual force, italics mine. Had King stayed the course, keeping God at the forefront of the movement through maintaining exclusively Christian leadership by Christian leaders, ministers and pastors, in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, I mean, duh, the outcome, I suspect, would have been very different. Alas, such was not to be the case. It amazes me that, even with the religious experience in his kitchen in 1957, so much of Martin Luther King's efforts remained wholly and completely secular, humanist, and socialist in nature. You know, Martin Luther King was a socialist, a religious socialist, but still a socialist. I presume from reading this that Dave Sim cannot imagine anyone can be a religious socialist, at least based on what he's writing thus far. I don't know. In meetings with Vice President Richard Nixon and Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, his tone is always that of a labor negotiator, a quasi-socialist, with nary a word said by him about God, nary an effort made to communicate as a minister of the gospel to wayward Christians. Kennedy and Johnson being rather more waywards as Christians go, one would guess, than were Nixon and Eisenhower. Had Nixon, as example, been addressed as a Quaker, Mr. Vice President, how can you as a white Christian gentleman deny to your black Christian brothers the rights and freedoms which you enjoy? It seems to me that it would have left a good deal less wiggle room. Let my people go, Reverend King, as Aaron addressing Richard Nixon as Pharaoh. There were any number of approaches that made more sense when standing on the moral high ground, as Martin Luther King surely was, than to function as a secular humanist quasi-socialist mouthpiece 
for a run-of-the-mill Marxist like Bayard Rustin. Uh, you know, he compares King to that of a labor negotiator. King was an avid supporter of labor unions. In fact, on the day of his assassination, he was in Tennessee supporting a strike of public sanitation workers, aka garbage truck people. Yeah, basically, basically the city of Memphis had a long time ago, well, in this case, a long time prior to 1968, said that being a garbage worker was effectively quote-unquote black work, and thus it was going to be a crappy job that nobody wanted, and the black employees were not having it, they went on strike. King went there to support that strike, and that's where he got assassinated. Of course, I can't speak for whether or not Dave Sim doesn't know this, or maybe he does know this and he's deliberately excluding it. I'll be honest, considering how insane he's been, I'm going to assume he just doesn't know it. Certainly, Martin Luther King had demonstrated time and again his oratorical skill in the striking, just so of the right note, le mot juste, and nowhere more exaltedly in his I Have a Dream speech delivered in front of the Lincoln Memorial in the summer of 1963. I have a dream that one day, every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. There it is. In past tangents, we've had attacks on Hillary Clinton, attacks on gay rights, attacks on weird perceptions of everything being communist. And now... We can truly say it's got the full right-wing squeak going for it. You got talks about MLK being too radically leftist and about how they love his I have a dream speech and yada, yada, yada. We've made it. Round of applause. Thank you, Dave Sim. It is hard to imagine any occasion in human history when the words of the fourth and fifth verses of Isaiah's monumental and awe-inspiring 40th chapter had so resonated with the souls and minds of so many people in one place and in one time than on that glorious sunlit August afternoon. Let freedom ring, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Reportedly, Coretta King was furious in the aftermath of the speech that she was not allowed to accompany King to his meeting with President Kennedy. I suspect that she had focused her attentions upon an earlier reference in the speech to little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers, and that her female nature typically and misguidedly believed that this reference to black and white children had some analogous application to black men and black women, white men and white women, that is, if the Reverend Martin Luther King belonged in the Oval Office that afternoon, so did his housewife. Okay, Dave, I mean, let's be real here. If your spouse, well, okay, uh, <laughs> pretend you're still married. All right, now, let's just say that y your wife had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Prime Minister of Canada. Wouldn't you be a bit annoyed if she didn't invite you? It, it's really not some sort of deep ideological or biological thing. It's literally just feeling left out when your spouse is invited to meet and, and talk with the literal highest office in the land. I mean, holy fuck. Holy fucking shit. <clears throat> But this is my last word on gender, so back to the ladies. The checkers playing tacticianettes do not ordinarily surrender a high-profile position such as Ella Baker enjoyed in the SCLC without bringing in a replacement tacticianette. Such seems to have been the case, and the SCLC board soon welcomed to its ranks Marion Logan, a New York fundraiser, friend to the lip-licking, ally of the note-passing, 
as Ella Baker turned her attentions more or less full-time to the radical, unsupervised, and wholly secular SNCC. The low, nearly bestial nature of the SNCC was always typified for me by its one-time leader James Foreman's assertion that, if the powers that be are unwilling to let my people sit at the table of government, we stand ready to knock the fucking legs right off the table, both for the mockery it made of the non-violent part of the SNCC's name, and for his vulgarity in saying so in the Beulah Baptist Church. Yeah, sorry, back to the ladies, quite right. What interested me about Marion Logan was that she circulated a memo to the other members of the SCLC board in advance of the Poor People's March on Washington, which Martin Luther King wholeheartedly favored, a position in which he was virtually alone of the SCLC executive. I doubt very seriously, Logan wrote, that the Washington actions would have any positive effect on Congress. If anything, the demonstrations may well harden congressional resistance and create an atmosphere conductive not only to the victory of reactionary candidates in the coming election, but also to the defeat of those candidates who are or would be friendly to the social and economic objectives of our struggle. Logan was also concerned that King and the SCLC would not be able to preserve the nonviolent image and integrity of our organization once the protests got underway. Given the explosive potential of the situation, serious violence would be inevitable. You say, Martin, that you will use disruptive tactics only as a last resort. But you understand, of course, Logan asserted, that in view of the likely police response to these disruptive tactics, you are in effect saying that you are prepared to court violence as a last resort. Logan was also troubled and unhappy, emphasis mine, at how inadequately the planning had been handled thus far. It does not appear to me or to anyone with whom I have talked that an adequate job has been done and there is the question of objectives. Have they been clarified? Have you worked out what you will accept, short of your total objectives? In response to Logan's admonitions, King phoned her almost daily for more than a week in an unsuccessful effort to persuade her to withdraw the complaints, which she had sent to the entire SCLC board. Andrew Young joined in the attempt, writing Logan and her husband, Arthur, that, quote, we are too far gone to turn around on the campaign, this is very much a faith venture emphasis mine. King's reaction seems to me disproportionate, and yet he persisted, seeming to believe that there was some greater level of importance to the memo than revealed on the surface, as if, as if the actual conflict between himself and Marion Logan was taking place on some loftier plane of existence, some more crucial battlefield than a difference of opinion between an organization's president and one of its board members. Some time later, King returned to New York City and went to the home of Marion and Arthur Logan, where he argued with Marion into the early morning hours about the memo she had distributed to the SCLC's board. King was depressed and exhausted and down drink after drink as he pressed her to withdraw her objections to the Washington protests. The Logans had spent many similar evenings with King when he had wanted to talk and drink until dawn, seemingly unable to find any rest in sleep. But this night was different and worse. King was unwe seemingly unable to find any reason and talk about something else. His mood changed repeatedly as the hours passed, from tension to calm and then back to barely restrained anger, and throughout it all he betrayed his usual anxiety with one hand tightly holding his frequently refilled glass and the other clenched into a fist with his thumb ceaselessly rubbing against the other finger. It seemed that King was losing hold, Marion Logan recalled. I suspect that this is what happened. In some very real sense, that night King did lose hold of the civil rights movement and it passed from his hands into those of Marion Logan and her secular humanist conferees, the checkers playing tacticianettes, the proto-feminists in waiting. Over the next few days, King continued to phone Marion Logan on an almost daily basis. Finally, on a rain-ravaged night in Memphis, he delivered a speech. I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a, li a long life. Longevity has its place, but I am not concerned about that now. 
I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I have looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land, and so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Sweat streaming from his brow and his eyes watering heavily, King moved to his seat. Some thought him so overcome by emotion that he was crying. Early that next evening, Martin Luther King was shot to death on the balcony outside his room at the Lorraine Motel. Of course, Marion Logan's memo could have been just that. A memo. Perhaps it was nothing more real than that. Perhaps it was, as it appeared on the surface, that Marion Logan merely had some hard questions for Dr. or Reverend Martin Luther King. You know, I, you can call him the Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King, or the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It's not one or the other. Just saying. Hard questions that he had been evading since the early days of the Montgomery Improvement Association. Hard questions, not the least of which was, how nonviolent can a movement be that knowingly courts violence as a means, television coverage, to an end, social change? Or perhaps her hard questions were, in some context, larger still, so that they caused the civil rights movement to slip from the hands of Martin Luther King, minister of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, a man chosen by God. Can any believer in retrospect believe otherwise? Wait, hang on. Okay, to slip. Okay, so he was chosen by God. Can any believer in retrospect? I mean, I guess it depends on the denomination. Like, you know, the whole, heck, even the guy he's named after, you know, Martin Luther. Well, I guess he would technically be named after Martin Luther King Sr., his dad. But Martin Luther was like, oh, no, you don't have to be, you know, approved by the Catholic Church to be called by God or something like that. And any Lutheran listeners, please give me more details, but you know what I'm talking about. Okay. To bring equality and justice to the men of his race, to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, italics mine, might attain to the promised house within the preamble to the United States Constitution that we hold these... <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> oh, my fucking... God. I, mean, I didn't dig... I forgot about this part. Okay? Okay. The promise housed within the preamble to the United States Constitution that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, italics mine. This is like... I mean... This is like... Okay, I know he's Canadian, but this is peak conservatism. There's an inability to understand the difference between law and the philosophy behind it. Namely, in this case, the preamble of the fucking Declaration of Independence. And yeah, he uses it to set a goal that all men are created equal. But, like, like, even if he meant to say Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence is not a legal document, at least not in the way that the Constitution is. I fucking vey. We're almost done. And through her memo, her hard questions, Marion Logan was the instrument which King caused the civil rights movement to pass from Martin Luther King's hands at the very threshold of destiny, on the very cusp of fulfillment, at the very dawning of that too long delayed day, first enunciated as a promise in the Constitution, clarified subsequently by Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and finally made inevitable by the enshrining of the 13th Amendment, abolishing in 1870 slavery's last outpost on this continent. I mean, actually, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I was originally thinking, wait, wasn't that Brazil? But then I realized, no, wait, Brazil is South America. Wrong America, but still in America. Although the 13th Amendment uh, does have that infamous loophole. Um, you know, you can still effectively be a slave if you're a prisoner. Oy vey. So that 1970 might evermore have been associated as both a centenary and fulfillment of the black man finding his long-promised and too long-delayed place in the sun of full equality with his white brothers, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty we're free at last. But instead, instead, 1970 would, be, would come to be synonymous with the onset of feminism, 
wherein the black man found his civil rights usurped by those who hold instead these poisonous fairy tale truths to be self-evident that black men are interchangeable with black women and white women that black men are interchangeable with homosexualists, that black men are interchangeable with children and infants, that black men are interchangeable with babies, that black men are interchangeable with cats, and that black men are interchangeable with dogs. That's... That's literally where it ends. Well, I should say there's a... Technically, there's a little disclaimer at the end. I, I guess I'll read that, so. Because of A, my choice not to reprint Tangent in the Form and Void trade paperback, although it is relevant so far as I'm concerned to the Recondite magazine portion of Ham and Mary Ernst Way's story, B, the fact that I have no plans in the foreseeable future to publish any collection of my essays, and C, mindful of the fact that issue 186, despite being universally deplored by male and female feminists, is one of the few Cerebus back issues to sell out virtually overnight, I hereby waive all trademark and copyright considerations to the essay and authorize any and all individuals to reproduce the essay in any form, print, electronic, or otherwise provided, that that reproduction is of the complete work and not excerpts from it which are authorized for journalistic purposes or as raw materials in another creative or journalistic work. Dave Sim, Kitchener, Ontario, March 16, 2001. But... Yeah, it literally just ends with with him just going nuts, saying that feminists usurp the civil rights movement. I mean, Sim, are, are you implying that MLK got shot by a feminist? Because MLK would have been shot anyway. He was at Memphis. I mean, yeah, it's not like some sort of feminist conspiracy caused him to go to Memphis. He seriously believed in labor rights and was an actual socialist. He went to Memphis to support the striking workers. I'm sure if he still had the, uh, you know, the respect within the SCLC that Dave Sim claims he had lost, he would have gone to Memphis anyway. This entire tangent, at least Tangent 5, was perhaps the downright strangest. It's his takes on the civil rights movement and how it was destroyed by feminism. I've heard that feminism had destroyed atheism, but I never would have expected him to say that feminism destroyed the fucking civil rights movement. Holy fuck. Talk about insulting. Talk about unhinged. I mean, I can't blame the fact that edition 186 sold out so well. People are probably curious to read the unhinged ramblings of this lunatic. Yeah, you could be good at writing and good at drawing comics, but that doesn't make you skilled in philosophy, my dude. Like, holy fuck. A lot of this was pretty funny, a lot of the whole tangent things in general. But this last one was perhaps the most left-field thing that I have ever read. Thank you all for listening. This has been Facts Fivem. Have a nice day. Hello, this is Fax Fivem, saying thank you for listening, and I sincerely hope that you enjoyed it. If you can, please like and share it around, and if you are feeling especially generous, please subscribe. I need at least 100 subscribers to change my YouTube channel's URL, and my default is long and ugly, and I really don't like it. It would be extremely helpful for me if you subscribed. But you don't have to. I'm not your boss. I'm just Fax Fivem. And right now, I'm signing off.